What is truth? Constructivists believe that all people possess different worldviews. These worldviews are constructed by interacting with elements within their own unique environments. Friends, family, peer groups, media, all conspire to influence how we see the world and in turn reinforce how we see this world. In other words, like a diamond, each of us is different. We all possess different characteristics, different traits, and different worldviews. So it begs the question, if each of us possess different worldviews, what does this say about truth? Is there an ultimate truth that we can all agree upon? Or is the truth that we believe in just a fabrication of our minds? This topic forms the basis of today's presentation. Scientists believe that there's only one interpretation of science and many people would agree with that. So in other words, is science not truth? The problem is there's a lot of science that we do not know. We live in an era of complexity where interrelated variables are so numerous that it's hard to predict outcomes even when we think we know the facts. In many ways, complete knowledge eludes us and our information gaps give rise to disagreements. Consider the pro-life, pro-choice debate. Defining when life begins is central to this debate. So scientific uncertainties sire opinion and differences in opinion give rise to disagreements and conflict. While there might be hard irrefutable facts such as how to calculate the area of a circle, how these facts work their way into human activities gives rise to value-based judgments. The area of a circle might tell us how much volume a cylinder of a certain height can hold, but it does not give us any insight into what that cylinder should hold. Some might argue that they know the open quote, truth, close quote. Consider the gun control debate it's hard to argue with the observation that if we outlaw guns, only outlaws will have guns. But indeed, some would argue against that by pre presenting statistics such as this, which argue that universal ownership of firearms does not indeed lead to lower homicide rates. Does this mean that everything's open to interpretation? Does constructivism mean that there is never a right or wrong answer? If so, how can we make decisions? How can we educate? Are we doomed to a cycle of 60 second debates over alternative facts? One way to understand how scientific facts become distorted, how we move from objective to subjective sense making, is by considering the stages along what we call the ladder of inference. At each step in this laddered process, there is room for facts to be usurped by interpretative biases and value judgments. Let's follow this process along from observation to action to see how this plays out. The first stage involves the data that we observe. How does one choose the good times or the bad times in summing up general observations? What sources do we use? Observations are subject to personal bias, and of course, other forms of data are compiled and released to the public by people who have vested interests. In other words, not all sources of data are equal. Consider the challenge of evaluating a program depicted by these two photos. Are the students in these pictures overall enjoying the program? To compound the problem, although we are subject to exogenous bias in where we get our data from, 
What we choose to accept as truth is subject to further interpretative bias. For any perspective, we can always find data to support our beliefs. Because something is a number, it doesn't mean that it represents the truth. Even after tailoring the data to suit our worldviews, we then process it further to further entrench our worldviews. Consider the scene presented earlier with students who are sleeping in a class, as seen through the eyes of a teacher with an external locus of control. For this person, he or she is a victim, subject to the actions and whims of others. To such a person, they're not the problem, it's them. It's not me. Now consider a classroom situation as seen through the eyes of a teacher with an internal locus of control, someone who believes their environment is controllable. For this person, he or she is an enabler, either positively or negatively. To such a person, the solution is also clear. I better ramp up my game. The point is, we attach meaning to every data source we are exposed to. Truth becomes what we perceive it to be. The data can be the same, but the meaning we attach can differ. Consider this sl slide here. Same slide, two disparate conclusions. Our interpretations then form the foundation of assumptions that underpin our logic. In other words, what we deem to be logical has been fabricated in a factory of our own creation. Our worldview translates our interpretation of the facts into assumptions, which to us seem absolutely unassailable. How we frame the problem frames the possibilities of resolving the problem. If students are lazy, they need an attitude adjustment. On the other hand, if they're sleeping because I'm failing to connect, I need to alter my pedagogic strategy. How I frame this problem frames the solution options. Ironically, despite all these subjective analytics, our conclusions appear to us to be irrefutable. We fail to recognize that just a subtle change in worldviews could have taken us in a completely different direction. How I have framed the problem has framed my solution space. To compound matters, we then act on our own conclusions based on other value frames, principles that have also been fabricated over time within our own cultural environment. Subtle differences in beliefs drastically alter solutions, even at this stage. Consider our teacher with the external locus of control. To this person, the students are lazy. Yet there are still various ways to resolve this. If our teacher believes in the power of individuals to change based on feedback, then communication represents a logical action. Tell them that you're dissatisfied with their performance and why. If on the other hand, the teacher believes that humans are incapable of change based on words alone, then rewards and punishment form the basis for one's actions. One's values frame behavior. All these factors conspire to influence our actions and to, to define us. By the time we act, we've been influenced by so many factors that truth seems to be but a whimsical notion. We have become products of our minds, and our minds, in turn, continue to shape our worlds and shape who we are. This, friends, engenders a troubling question. Could it be that this wacko is right? Do we live in a world of alternative facts? To a degree, the answer is yes. What we typically perceive to be facts are often interpretative conclusions that are influenced by values and assumptions. In such a world, the best that teachers can do is to equip students with the critical analysis skills necessary 
to recognize the influences that shape both their worldviews and the worldviews of others, to help them understand the value bases and the assumptions that guide behavior. To do so, here's a checklist that students, indeed that we could use, to guide an analysis of our own worldviews. Firstly, to vet observations. We might want to ask, have I sought out all competing data sources? To critically assess selection, we might want to ask, why did I select the data that I eventually decided upon? To glean meaning, we might want to ask, how did I attach meaning to this data and why? To reflect on assumptions, we might want to ask, what assumptions have I attached to this analysis? To evaluate conclusions, we might want to ask ourselves, are my conclusions the same that others would drive? And if not, why not? To unearth beliefs, we might want to ask ourselves, how are my beliefs shaping my conclusions? And finally, to evaluate actions, we might want to reflect upon whether or not my actions will, reflect, will clash with the beliefs of others. And if so, why? In conclusion, constructivism is not about separating lies from the truth. Rather, it's about separating the truths, plural, from lies. And that requires in-depth analysis and reflection upon, why, reflection upon why multiple truths indeed do exist. To constructivists in general and to social constructivists in particular, this requires an open, communicative environment. People need to disagree, they need to debate, they need to analyze in a respectful, open way, and then they need to reflect upon this interaction. We live in a world where people are unique, and this means that we all see the world in a different way. If we wish, therefore, to understand how our world looks in the eyes of others, we need to understand both ourselves and others. Collaborative discussions, dialectics, debates, critical analysis, these are all channels or tools through which constructivist learning strategies enable students to understand the worldviews that shape their own beliefs and the worldviews held by others that could cause disagreement or dissonance. So what is truth? Well, truth is a worldview underpinned by scientific evidence, but it is then distorted and shaped by assumptions and values. There are as many truths as there are assumptions and values. But that doesn't mean that there's never a right or a wrong. Under any given set of assumptions and values, there are conclusions that are more valid than others. But to understand this, we must seek to understand the bases upon which we all make sense of the world. And that, friends, is truth in the eyes of a constructivist. Thanks for joining us.